spero di stare nei tempi to remind me if I speak too long and I hope I will be able to stick to the time allotted to my speech because the topic I'm going to deal with is intended to give you an overview on the history of these facilities during the Second World War, these camps uh, were widely scattered throughout the Italian territory uh, and our army captured a lot of uh, enemies, a lot of war prisoners and the very same camp of Fossoli is uh, evidence of this, uh, evidence also of the fact that also civilians were interned in these camps. But I'm not going to talk about the civilians held in these camps too long. I would like to start by showing that during the war, Italy was initially not prepared in dealing prisoners. And this is something that can be clearly visible from this table. There was a first stage in which um, some guidelines uh, were provided on how to organize camps and how to guarantee the protection, to guarantee protection to captured prisoners and to guarantee them uh, adequate facilities. Norms uh, started to be approved in 1930 and that is because in 1929 the Geneva Convention was signed. These norms were then developed up until 1940 with uh, the, uh, the decree of uh, the Duce uh, trying to give um, uh, some kind of guidelines on how to manage the initial stage. But when it comes to facilities, initially there was no organization, no adequate preparation. The organizational, st organizational stage would come only later, uh, around uh, 1940. In those years, an intergovernmental uh, committee were comprising 16 members from various ministries, uh, including uh, the Italian for African, uh, for it the Italian Africa would set up. So 16 members making up this committee. And this committee uh, was not very efficient in making decisions. Uh, there was too much bureaucracy. Therefore, in January 1949, um, a leaner committee uh, was set up, as well as an office, a department, uh, especially devoted to deal with prisoners. In August 1940, there were only, there were only a few prisoners, uh, French and British, but after them, uh, we would have the Greek, we would have the uh, prisoners from the former Yugoslavia, a lot of prisoners from Britain captured in Northern Africa, so the system would become more and more complex, uh, and more facilities and more places would have to be needed to better organize that. The whole system was developed between 1941 and 1942, and it was not by chance that the very same fossil camp between the summer, the spring and the summer of 1942 was involved in this kind of development. I would also like uh, to address um, a little bit what happened to these facilities after the, eth the 8th of September. These were facilities which uh, more or less underwent uh, the same uh, uh, events than uh, fossilly and I would ultimately talk about uh, the so to say the evidence the remaining evidence of uh, these prisoners in these camps today here you see a number of evidence uh, that uh, the office for prisoners of war sent to the individual ministries involved to understand what the situation was. And here you see a number of uh, tables um, with data on the number of prisoners. The table on the left refers to dates back to September 1941. Mm, so prisoners captured by our army in Russia, 14,477, and uh, 
a large number of that were given to the Germans. This piece of data is always very important when talking about transit camps. Uh, in uh, going to Russia, for example, Italy built 11 camps for prisoners, but they were temporary camps. Uh, they were temporary camps, and those were the routes. And the bulk of these prisoners would then be handed over to the Germans. And we will then see how these camps were structured in these areas. The piece of data reported there is 26, around 26,000 um, prisoners in total, some of them also overseas. Some of these prisoners uh, would transit through an Albanian camp, through the Fileni camp in Albania, where Greek prison prisoners uh, and Yugoslav prisoners would also transit through. Then there were other camps, uh, temporary camps in Eastern Africa, and other camps in Libya as well. The other table you see in the slide shows a significant increase, over 100,000 prisoners after uh, a battle in Libya, Italy captured a large number of British prisoners who were then distributed through the various camps, they would transit in temporary camps in Libya and they would then uh, uh, reach metropolitan areas and many of them would also reach Fossoli. So this is the situation of our camps. This uh, picture dates back uh, to 1941. If you look at Sardinia, in the island uh, there were labor camps. In Carbonia, for example, prisoners would work in the mines, and the same applies to Tuscany. This system was done replicated also in the Umbria region as early as September, as in September 1941. So prisoners were used for labor, for forced labor. The system was still being developed at the time. And what we said before perfectly applied to this situation as well. All the camps built at this stage had to be close to tracks or to train stations, first and foremost to, uh, to guarantee the possibility for prisoners to be sent elsewhere and also for the provision of food and other supplies. If you look at this map, you can see that the system uh, gradually developed in an even more complex way. This uh, map uh, is a map of now of January 1943. Fossily is also indicated in the map. The red dots uh, remind us of the initial organization of the various types of prisoners. We also have civilians here because also uh, civilians were interned and their situation was managed by the Ministry for War. So the mesh gradually developed. However, a whole series of small and big labor, forced labor facilities are not indicated here. In May 1942, a law was approved uh, that discipline that regulated the, the transfer of prisoners to private companies. And then when they understood that many people had to be sent to war, and therefore it was necessary for some companies, also companies working on the farms, to use uh, prisoners. So this map, uh, this mesh, uh, should be overlapped uh, with other temporary facilities uh, for the provision of prisoners uh, for labor. The system kind of exploded in uh, 1942, between the end of 41 and uh, 1942, when a lot of prisoners captured in Northern Africa would flow into the system. You can see them from the heads. Many of them came from Cyprus, uh, from uh, Britain, from Australia. Uh, this is not this is actually, these are images of uh, prisoners from India captured there. Um, and they were in very complicated, were undergoing a very complicated uh, situations. So British prisoners, thirsty British prisoners, they created a lot of problems. 
Now, I don't have the time to go uh, into the details of how um, these troops were managed. Here you see a list of the temporary camps that were set up in Libya uh, between 1941 and 42. They more or less uh, uh, resemble the same network of metropolitan areas. Uh, the the prisoner also had a number in order for them to, prisoners had a number for them to receive letters. Uh, we had very few metropolitan areas. There were ships transporting prisoners towards the national territory, 13 in particular. Uh, there were lots of ports in Brindisi, in Naples. Many of them uh, came from the coast, from Benghazi, from Tripoli, from Tobruk. So lots of prisoners would be sent. There were uh, lots of camps built in Libya. And they were then sent to less temporary camps, so to say. Here you see prisoners from the Balkans. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. But there were camps I'd like to focus on, uh, mainly in the Soviet Union. So we ended up in capturing about 20,000 prisoners. And this is a picture of a camp in the Soviet Union, so near a river. It is also very difficult to understand the camp. There's too much light, you cannot see it well. So this was a temporary camp set up by the Italians, and the prisoners hosted there would then be given, handed over to the Soviets. A different situation was the one of the camps who in whom, which we set up in the southwest, in the southeast of France. They were for people from uh, Indochina. Some civilians were also interned, and they were used for uh, labor in uh, the French territory under our competence, because Italy had a number of areas under its uh, military occupation, especially the area of, uh, it was the uh, Legnano command which organized this. We're talking about very significant numbers here. We're talking about tens of thousands of uh, prisoners, uh, over 10,000 people over 10,000 prisoners. So prisoners would arrive here. Uh, you had temporary camps, uh, uh, camps in which, for example, prisoners were kept in quarantine. They would then reach the metropolitan area and transports were normally made uh, with the rail network because the camps were built near stations. Most of them were built near stations. And then in 1940, there was no organized structure, but uh, there was a camp, Fonte d'Amore, in near Sulmone, in the Abruzzo region, and that dated back to the period of the First World War. It was restructured and it was opened for French, uh, English, and later on Greek prisoners. Here you see a picture of uh, a camp uh, in Servigliano, in the Italian uh, province of Fermo. Uh, this was a camp that dated back to the period of the First World War. It was reopened for Greek prisoners and then later on for British prisoners. The British prisoners were the most numerous. You had barracks there. The barracks uh, were restructured, restored. The barracks had been partly used again by the Ministry for War as a military 
deposit uh, and then the barracks were then used for a different purpose. If you look at the architecture and the way in which the barracks were restored, well, also their architecture was very impactful because we are talking about facilities dating back to the First World War. This is visible also from here. This is a turret. This is a turret which is not that similar to that of the Nazi camps. Uh, and it is not by, by chance that in 1942 the Ministry for War changed the situation. So in October 1942 it sent a mission to Germany to study, to analyze how camps were uh, structured in Germany. And they tried to, in a way, uh, analyze the situation in view of uh, future uh, camps in Italy. The, that was the October of 1942. Uh, military, the military events then changed the situation, so many of the projects that uh, were started at the time uh, rem only remained on paper. But some facilities were indeed built. This was uh, a former building in the town of Sforza Costa, near the town of Macerata, a camp for 8,000 uh, prisoners. This uh, is a picture from the inside of the camp, uh, with beds. And they started uh, identifying the various sectors of the camp uh, and dividing the various areas of the camps uh, in order for the militaries to better control the prisoners. In Germany, prisoners were all uh, used for forced labor. And so here too, uh, small workshops, uh, carpenters' workshops, uh, were built. These pictures were propaganda pictures. Here too, you see, for example, a picture of uh, British uh, soldiers. There was uh, a band in the camp of Monturano in the town, near the town of Fermo. After the 8th of September 1943, the situation slightly changed. This is the map that was given to me by the son of a former prisoner. This was made, uh, this had been made by his father. And it shows how it, is, how it was possible to reach the southern front. The red part is the area of the Allied forces that freed the territory. This, a similar situation happened in Fossoli too. Many of the prisoners uh, were captured from the Germans, by the Germans. Uh, they would be deported to Germany. And uh, we have some data on uh, the people from, uh, on the prisoners from the Fossoli camp. Uh, a category of citizens uh, who uh, deserve better investigation because they would. Uh, in a way, risk their lives as well. Uh, I mean, further investigation should be done on the righteous citizens helping the prisoners. Um, let me briefly address what uh, remains of the two camps. This is a picture of the Servigliano camp. Uh, this is the entrance. Uh, after the 8th of September, many of the prisoners uh, managed to escape the camp, managed to flee. Many of them uh, were uh, helped by the population. The facility was then uh, taken by the Germans, and there was a parallel story of this story. But this story started well before, on the 5th of October 1943. This Servigliano camp became a camp for the partisans and the Jews who were captured in the province of Ascoli. Uh, Piceno. So uh, it was the Social Republic uh, who was in charge of managing the camp. And after that, there was a deputation in uh, uh, May 1944 uh, uh, with prisoners being sent from this Servigliano camp to Fossoli and the subsequent deputation to Auschwitz. The plates, these plates basically. Uh, remind us of all the various uses that were made of the Servigliano camp and they are a, uh, a nice remembrance of 
the various destinations. So a camp of internment and deportation of the Jews, then the escape of the 8th of September, then the, there is a, a third plate which also testifies to the fact that the Castelvigliano camp became a place in which uh, Istrian Dalmatian uh, refugees were hosted. You have a soccer field uh, here, no more barracks. Some barracks were used uh, as lodgings. And a house of remembrance was set up, uh, starting from uh, the mid-1990s, the task. The aim of this house was actually to cast light on what happened here. And we have uh, a room in which we host uh, visitors, schools. And then there's another camp, a nearby camp, that's the camp of Monturano Fermo, there's this small town of Monturano. This is uh, actually an, uh, a former factory near the Tenna River, in the, near the, 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 the small town of Sforza Costa. This is a picture that dates back to the 1990s. Here too, prisoners were all captured by the Germans and deported. And the facility was then used again by Croatian refugees soon after the Second World War. It was managed by the Allied. This is not very well visible, but this slide shows the area where the Croatian church was. The Croatians uh, stayed there for some years. They would then, uh, most of them would then uh, leave uh, for uh, Argentina. And today, also thanks to the big work done by civil society, a number of uh, uh, wall paintings have been done, projects have been done with schools, a documentary was done. Um, city schools carried out a number of projects and uh, all the three camps, Servigliano, Fonte d'Amore and Monturano, uh, were basically characterized by uh, the testimonies of a lot of uh, visitors, relatives of many prisoners who participate in this march for liberty along the Tenna River. It is this march normally takes place in September. So exactly on the days in which the liberation took place. And this in Mount S in Monte San Martino, that's a small town near Macerata, which is not far away from the Servigliano camp. And that hosted a number of prisoners. So you also have a coming back of relatives who want to see where the lives of uh, their relatives, of their descendants actually, of their ancestors uh, uh, passed. So the network, the mesh of camps, uh, does not include many of the camps I have uh, mentioned. That mesh, that network has sort of been raised. These are virtues examples. Fossil is probably the most virtuous one, and then the rest is almost uh, is virtually non-existent. Even if there are signs of remembrance, uh, these are not visible. So starting from this uh, conference, I think that we should uh, try and trace back where these camps have been. We should not forget this history, because this history is very similar to the one experienced by those uh, who uh, transited through the Fossoli camp. Thank you very much.